In the Old Testament, 1 Chronicles chapter 5, verses 1 through 2. Believing that you've all found it, I will read for us. 1 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 1. Now the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, for he was the firstborn, but because he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given to the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel, so that he is not enrolled in the genealogy according to the birthright. Though Judah prevailed over his brothers, and from him came the leader, yet the birthright belonged to Joseph. And this is the word of God. Amen. Covenant of the Torch. And true firstborn. Covenant of Torch is one of the most important covenants in the Bible because it's actually the covenant that shows in most vivid detail how the kingdom of God will be established. And we learned through numerous times that Covenant of Torch is fulfilled by the fourth generation, right? And we all learned that the fourth generation is who? The fourth generation is Joseph, right? Yeah. So you see, the fourth generation should not only remind you who is the fulfiller. When the fourth generation appears, we mean we know that the covenant of torch is about to be fulfilled, right? Because God says in the fourth generation, you'll return here, right? So for us, in the fourth generation, we will return to our spiritual Canaan. So the fourth generation should ring in your mind, not only who, but when as well. When the fourth generation emerges, that means the fulfillment is at hand. Amen? So it is extremely important we understand who is this fourth generation. The fourth generation is Joseph, as we know. But as you can see, I didn't use this name. I used this word, the firstborn. I want to see whom God sees or acknowledges as his firstborn today. Joseph, although he is a fulfiller of this covenant of the torch, very, very ironically, he dies in Egypt. He does not get to go to Canaan. And that is like the last verse in Genesis' whole book. So for us, when we look at this in human eyes, we are rather disappointed. It doesn't make sense. So Joseph is the one to take all the Israelites into Canaan, which refers to spiritual Canaan, heaven for us. What's very really interesting is that when he died, he could have asked all the people to bury him in Canaan first. We saw this before, right? But instead he chose to remain with his people. Israelites knew how to get there. When Joseph's father, Jacob, died, because Joseph was still the prime minister of Egypt, there was a huge procession of funeral. Even the Egyptians mourned for many, many days, right? And the Israelites actually left Egypt once and entered Canaan. So they know the route to Canaan. They've been there, they know where to bury. And Joseph was at the lead. So when he died, Joseph could have asked his people to bury me in Canaan just as my father was. I pray that we will truly understand the heart of Joseph when he declared in the end of Genesis 50, although I die, God's covenant is true. Although I die and I am the fourth generation, I am supposed to be the fulfiller, but don't worry because God will keep his promise, will come to you and pluck you out from this land and bring you to the land that's promised to our forefathers. This moment was so important, was so significant that God has chose this scene of his entire life of Joseph to be captured in the chapter of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. Why is death so important to God? Why was it a success and not a failure? Because Joseph's choice 
even though he died, even in his death, he chose to stay with his people. So when Joseph died, and because of his last will and testament, all the Israelites will all enter into the same living faith that Joseph had. And just as Joseph was that firstborn, the fourth generation, because they clung to the same promise that Joseph spoke to them, by this power of the covenant, they also jumped and entered into Joseph. So they also became the firstborn. You see, who gives the message of the covenant to us is so important. And so because of this, when God later takes him out from Egypt, he declares to Pharaoh, right, let go of Israel. They are my firstborn. All Israelites became firstborn because of who? Because this one man, Joseph, and his faith. Even death could not stop him from believing in the covenant of God. This foreshadows who? Jesus Christ. This is the power of death. Death is like a gateway for unity. True firstborns have this power. Even their death, even though Satan can mock him right there on the spot, right? They did not know what was really happening. When they died, they actually became one with the people that they loved. When Jesus died, he did not die alone. He died with us. He carried all of us, all of our brothers and sisters around the world, and everybody who ever walked on the planet of the earth in his heart and died. And by the power of resurrection, he rose with all of us together. And after he rose, he did not only stay there, he always took us all to where? Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Because last week was Easter, right? We had our resurrection Sunday, and we also had our holy communion of becoming one with Jesus Christ. So Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, starting 1, it talks about how we were living according to the prince of the power of the air. We were the sons of disobedience. We are completely hopeless, right? But by Father's boundless grace, he, let's read from verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love, which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses. We are not dead. We've never died before, right? But in God's eyes, we were because of our sins. So we were dead in our trespasses, but made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved, raised us up together, right? So he rose together with us and made us sit together with Jesus. Where? Where? In heavenly places. That is our current address. Okay. So I'm going to elaborate more on this. So here, Joseph became one with the Israelites. Now, he died in 1806 B.C. He was placed in coffin, and that's the end of Genesis 50. But play, being placed in coffin is not the end of the burial, right? You have to have a homegoing service when the coffin is laid down into the ground. And it was at Shechem. In 1390 B.C., after they entered into Canaan, there were 16 years of conquest war, and then they were burying Joseph. So there was a homegoing service here, right? So from 1806 BC until 1390 BC, this funeral procession took place for 416 years, right? Why these long years? This long period was necessary for Joseph and Israel to be bound as one 
through the smoking oven. I'm going to put it like a furnace and the torch. This is a covenant of a torch, right? The torch, the flaming torch passed through and then not only the torch was there, there's another object, vision. It was a smoking oven. And we all learned that smoking oven symbolizes the extreme heat, so hot that you can't even melt an iron or metal, right? It's referring to the suffering of the people in Egypt to be refined, to come out as pure gold, right? But God is saying when he showed this vision to Abraham to make the covenant of torch, there will not only be the smoking, the smoking oven, the, the suffering, but my presence symbolized by his torch, which is flaming, which will never be quenched, will be with you right next to it. So this entire 416 years of the suffering of the Israelites in Egypt was a time through the suffering, the people and Joseph, the fourth generation, become one. That's why with the Exodus, they were able to come out together, right? And same thing is happening to us right now. Through the death of Jesus Christ, even right now this Sunday, we are getting one step closer to becoming one with Jesus Christ to form one body. Yes, there is a suffering, physical suffering, mental suffering, what kind of suffering there may be, right? There is a suffering, but please be assured there is a torch right next to you. All of this is so that we can become one and be fulfilled right here. Okay. So this is the, in, only an introduction, but what, I'm really wanna, uh, I, what I really want to share with you is about the firstborn, the characteristics of the firstborn. And we know that Joseph is a firstborn, and Joseph is the one who symbolized Jesus Christ. But what's amazing is, as we read in First Chronicles chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, our opening verse, the true firstborns are not written in the genealogy. That's how we know, because the first Chronicles chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, we know that Joseph is the fourth generation. That's the one of the strongest evidence. Why not you know, other brothers of the 12 sons of Israel, right? Joseph is the one. Let's turn to that verse one more time. First Chronicles chapter 5, verse 1 through 2. First Chronicles chapter 5, chapter 5, verse 1 through 2 says, Now the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, Physically, he was a firstborn, but because he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given to who? Sons of Joseph, right? So that he is not enrolled in the genealogy according to the birthright. This is an important part, okay? And then, so there's Reuben, Simeon, Levi, all three disqualified from becoming the firstborn, right? So automatically the fourth is Judah. But before Judah is mentioned, all of a sudden, God interjects with Joseph. Say, hey guys, remember, it's Joseph. He's a firstborn. But remember, he's not going to be in the genealogy. Very interesting, right? And then only that, verse 2, he says, though Judah prevailed over his brothers, and from him came the leader, which is a very significant statement, means king came from him. Uh, which king are we talking about? Jesus Christ, right? But although him, from him the king leader, yet birthright belongs to Joseph. So God makes twice his point. Don't forget, who is the firstborn? Joseph is the firstborn. And then Jacob pronounces this prophecy to his 12 sons, which becomes even more confusing. Even to this day, all the scholars are boggled by this. That's in Genesis chapter 49. Genesis 49, verse 10, and verse 24. Jacob prophesies that Jesus Christ will come. He came from the tribe of Judah, right? We all know that. But also from another tribe. That's why this is very, very confusing. Genesis 49, verse 10 says, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet. The scepter is kingship because only kings hold the scepters, right? So, but until when? Until Shiloh come. Who is Shiloh? Us? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Shalom is the one who brings peace. Okay. 
So it it seems like Judah is going to have a scepter, but until he like defines a time, until Shiloh comes. Now look at go to verse twenty four, please. Verse twenty four says, "Now this is for Joseph." Okay, uh, so we we see for for Judah. Okay, uh, from Judah Shiloh comes, and so the Messiah is coming from his tribe. So everybody knows that. Right, but the the boggling one is verse twenty four. It says, "But his bow, Joseph's bow, remained firm, and his arms were agile, from the hands of the mighty one of Jacob. From there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel." So he, he, in this um, NASB, it says, "From there." Okay, so there is a a interpretation. It's there or from him or is it referring to a place or is it referring to a person is it referring to Joseph is it referring to God who is this referring to but everybody says you know what it must be the Almighty God so yes from God there will come the shepherd and the stone of Israel who is a true shepherd yeah Jesus Christ John chapter ten verse fourteen Jesus says I am the good shepherd why because I lay down my life for my sheep. And who is the real rock, real stone of Israel? Jesus. Also, First Corinthians chapter ten, verse four. When the Israelites were wandering in the wilderness, there is a stone to follow them. The verse says to give them water so they don't die, right? And that rock is Jesus Christ. So here, when jo- Jacob's blessing Joseph, he's giving the blessings of Messiah to the tribe of Joseph too. So people are like, "What is going on?" Let me draw it like this. So it's Abraham who received the covenant of the torch. That's why it's very, very important we become the heirs, the descendants of Abraham, because this covenant was made to him and his descendants. If we are not his descendants, this covenant has nothing to do with us. We will not partake in the kingdom of God. In other words, so from Abraham we have Isaac and Jacob. So far, so good. First generation, second generation, third generation. The fourth generation is in question. Now, from fourth generation, we see Judah. We all very know this. This is just the way Matthew one genealogy, Jesus' genealogy shows. Now, from Judah, Jesus came. That's what we just read in forty nine verse ten, right? But here, Jacob is prophesying that there will be also Joseph. Right, and from him, also the Messiah will come. How can this be? Right. So from yes, it's from Abraham. Both are fourth generation: Judah and Joseph. And we know this for sure. Then what is this then? How is this fulfilled? So let's look at some more verses. Joseph actually is not in the genealogy, just as we read earlier, right? He was actually taken out from the genealogy, and you know why, right? Okay, that is in Genesis forty-eight, verse five. Genesis forty-eight, verse five. What's happening is Jacob went to Egypt. He sees two sons of Joseph were born in Egypt. Who are they? Ephraim and Manasseh, right? And so the grandpa comes to see the grandchildren, and all of a sudden he claims the grandchildren as his own son. That is a very bizarre thing to do. Let's read this, Genesis forty-eight, verse five. So Jacob says to Joseph, says, "Now your two sons, who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt, are mine." So it's not an expression say, "Oh, my grandkids are just so beautiful. Yeah, they're gonna be my kids." It's not like that. Look at the next part. Ephraim and Manasseh shall be mine, just as Reuben and Simeon are. So that's putting Joseph, Manasseh, Ephraim into the same line of generation, which is impossible, right? So naturally, Joseph is taken out. He is missing from the genealogy. Because his two sons Ephraim and Manasseh are placed in his own place, so just Joseph has nowhere to go. So what happened to Joseph? He now becomes a man without genealogy. 
God hides his firstborns. God hides his firstborns without genealogy. This is very important. I'm wondering why does God not want to record Joseph in the genealogy, right? There's a reason. Who rings a bell? Oh, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> who do you, who are you reminded by when you say without genealogy? Jesus is without genealogy, right? Yeah. Because yes, he does come from the line of tribe Judah, but well, it will actually, it's the Holy Spirit that was conceived, right? And so actually Jesus has nothing to do with this line. Oh, so God is somehow talking about oh, another route of Jesus' real you know, line. But we want to focus on this, right? Joseph is without genealogy. Jesus is without genealogy. And also who is without genealogy? Melchizedek. But actually, Melchizedek is all connected here. Abraham met Melchizedek already, right? And so is Jesus is also connected to Melchizedek, as we'll see more, okay? But you see, this Joseph is a very important link. Very, very interesting. The Matthew and genealogy actually list Jesus. His father's name was who? Not the real father, but Mary's husband's name was? Joseph, Joseph's father's name was Jacob, right? What, a, what an amazing coincidence, right? But then Jesus comes from tribe of Judah, right? So how do we explain this without genealogy? Let us also turn to Hebrews chapter 7, verse 1 through 3 to see who this Melchizedek is. The very famous man without genealogy. He was a historical figure. He was a king of Salem, but he is introduced as a man without genealogy. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 1 through 3. Okay, let's read together. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of most high God. Please note this. He has two offices. He's both king and the priest. Okay. He's a king in Salem, but he's a priest of the most high God. And then, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains what? Continually? Remains priest continually. So this not being part of genealogy, right? Not, although you're a physical human being, just like Joseph, he's a, a man, right? But he was taken out from the genealogy, right? Although he's a firstborn. All of it has to do with what? With this Melchizedek. You see, Melchizedek, what office is emphasized the most in this verse we just read? He will remain a priest continually. He's made like the son of God. So this line, okay, is what line? Let's say Judah received the scepter, right? the ruling power. So this is a line of kingship. Right? But here, Joseph, this line, if he referred to Melchizedek, this is line of priesthood. So there's Jesus Christ coming as a line of kings, you know, David, Solomon, all those kings family. But there's another mysterious, uh, non-written in genealogy line, it's called the line of Melchizedek. It's a line of a priest. So next, God elaborates this for us in Romans chapter 1, verse 3 to 4. How did Jesus fulfill both of these offices? Okay. So if I may add one more, this shows Jesus' humanity. Right? Right? The line of human, the, the line of flesh. But this is line of spiritual, spiritual line, right? So it is his divinity. And Joseph is foreshadowing all of this, which is very amazing. Romans chapter 1, verse 3 to 4. It's concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, 
who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. Ah, he was born according to the line of David, which is the tribe of Judah, right? But that is a line according to flesh. It's called clear, right? And verse 4, this is important from here. And declared to be son of God with the power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Okay? So Jesus came in both humanity and divinity. But what it's saying is like this. Jesus came, forsook his throne from above, and came down to earth, right? And lived for, so this is humanity. This is lying according to flesh. He came as a tribe of Judah, right? And then he lived like this for 33 years in his life, and here, at the cross, he finishes his life. So here, it's like the genealogy kind of stops here, right? But does that mean it's over with Jesus Christ? No. It says, this is by, according to flesh, Jesus lived like this, and then at the cross, he was declared as son of God. And from here, this is according to holy, spirit of holiness, right? Holy spirit. So spirit. So this is divinity. We can look at it like this. I mean, okay, this does not mean Jesus Christ was not the Son of God before the crucifixion, right? You have to make this very clear. Jesus came down as Son of God. He was on throne uh, in heaven with Father, and Father says, I'm going to send you. So Jesus says, Amen. He came down, right? He was already Son of God when he came down. So he was always both perfect man, perfect God, until the crucifixion, and the resurrection, Jesus declared to be son of God. That means God says, my son, my son, my son, right? But when Jesus laid down his life for all of us, he's like, oh, this is, my, this is my, really my real son. Do you see? That God declared Jesus as, oh, he's really my son. Because he proved himself. Okay. Let's read that verse one more time. It's, it's it kind of tricky. Romans chapter 1, verse 3 to 4, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Okay, there's two ways. Who was born of the seed of David according to flesh. He was born into this world according to the line of Judah, right? And declared to be son of God with the power according to the spirit by the resurrection from the dead. What is this place? This is where he declared himself to be son of God. This is where he proved himself to be the true firstborn. And this place we know is called the Shechem spiritually. Right? What is Shechem? Let's go back to Joseph. Shechem is a place where Father Jacob sent him away to his brothers. So to Joseph, when he said, uh, when, when she's buried at Shechem, I thought that he might not even like to be buried at Shechem because that's where everything started, right? I mean, although it's not a Shechem, it's, it was a Dothan. The brothers had moved to Dothan by the time Joseph reached them. But it was to Shechem the father sent the son. And Genesis 37, in Genesis 37 verse 13, When we read this, thinking about Jesus Christ, it's a very tearful scene. Genesis chapter 37, verse 13. It says, Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing in the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send you to them. This Shechem is where Father sends his son to the brothers. Joseph knew that his brothers hated him. Going there is like really to be killed, right? But what does Joseph say? Because father said so, the son says, I will go. 
this truly remind us what Jesus Christ did when Father sent him down to this earth, right? So Matthew chapter um, 20, verse 28 20, 28. Jesus Christ also was sent not to be served as a king, but to serve, to lay down his life as ransom for many. Right? So true firstborn means first, we do Father's will. What is Father's will? What is Father's will to Shallow? I send you to your brothers. Even though we know that we are not going to be treated well, we go. Even though that person is so blockheaded, it doesn't matter how much I speak to them, how much I invited them to church, how much I, you know, they just don't turn, right? Still, I send you to your brothers and we say, Amen. Second, what the true firstborns do, Shechem, True firstborn serve. They serve the father, right? Also, they serve the brothers. Now, how do they serve brothers? Their forgiveness. That's in Genesis chapter 50, verse 19 through 20. How did Jesus declare himself to be son of God. Why does he have to do this? We know why. So we can do the same. He's the way, right? He's a way for us to follow. Okay, Genesis 50 verse 19 to 20 says, but Joseph said to them, do not be afraid for am I in God's place? The scene is, because Father Jacob died, all the 11 brothers, they were like, oh my gosh, now we are dead. Joseph will take vengeance upon us, right? And so he, they went and said, oh, please forgive us. You know, we're the one who t threw you in the pit. Yes, we tried to kill you. The Shechem whole thing that you was all our fault. But what does Joseph say? Don't be afraid. He's saying, am I not in God's place? Means I am not going to be judge. Only judge is God himself. Verse, verse 20 says, but as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. See, Joseph understood. God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. So he knew that all of this suffering and agony, who suffered more than Joseph? You know, he was so wrongly accused. He was so like a slave. He lived like a slave for many, many years. Even though he did so well in the house, he was, he was accused again, thrown into a dungeon, right? Betrayed by these people in the jail. But still, Joseph says all of that was because God ultimately wanted to save many people alive. That's why he turned everything, even the evil that you meant against me, he turned into good. This is a way we overcome evil with good. It's this verse. Same way Jesus also. In Luke chapter 23, verse 34. To the very people who is stabbing him to kill him at the moment, what does Jesus pray? Father, please forgive them. For they, don't, they do not know what they do. True firstborn's characteristics is forgiveness. When we say we serve people, we, we don't mean, oh, oh, hey, hi, we drank some coffee, can I serve you? It's not just that, right? True serving our brothers is forgiveness. This is what happened in Shechem, and this became a gateway, right? Jesus declared himself to be the son of God here, and we died together with him, just as Israelites became one with Joseph, right? And so from here, a new phase begins. Are we going to hold on to Jesus before the crucifixion or after the resurrection? Which Jesus are you holding on to now? Why do you seek the living from the dead? 
Where is Jesus right now? Just to help us see clearly. <laughs> okay. He's on the right side of the throne. Doing what? Praying, interceding, mediating for us, right? So if we die together, as we just read in Ephesians chapter 2, we rose together with him, and he also made us sit together with him in the heavenly places. And this, from here to here, is a priesthood. Jesus became the perfect high priest right here. What do priests do? They're like servants. They serve God, and they also serve people. The priests take all the sins of, of the people and put them on their shoulders, and they go into the sanctuary and atone for their sins, right? To make peace between God and men. All the 77 generations of high priests, they all died because of their own sins. But Jesus Christ being the perfect high priest, why? Because he was not only the high priest, he also became the perfect ransom, perfect offering. He became the offering himself, right? What do you need? We need three things for the priesthood. First, the priest. Second, the offering, the gift. Third, the place, the temple. Jesus was a perfect temple, right? So he qualified all these three, and so he offered all offerings necessary for all of our sins, once for all. So this is done. Now new life begins. We just went through Easter last week. Yesterday our pastor preached and he said, why is that our church, we suffer and pray so much during the Lent of, uh, Lenten season and stop praying after Easter? <laughs> because Pentecost came, right, when the disciples gathered and prayed like crazy, right? But why do our church all stop praying? It's like party time. <laughs> you forget the essence. I'm like, that's so true. What happens after the resurrection, right? We must enter this place. Jesus Christ, what did he do? When he died on the cross, he tore his flesh to tear the veil in two, opened the way into the holy of holies, right? So let's actually go through this through the verse. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7 through 10 explains this very well. Before becoming a priest, after becoming the priest, okay? My expressions are very crude. Please pardon me, but, okay, that's uh, just to help us understand. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7 through 10. So Jesus, who in the days of flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, was heard because of his golly fear. Why did he pray like this? So that he can become one with us, right? One, to, to give life to all of us. And that he was hurt because of his godly fear. Verse 8, though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. So if we are suffering right now, let us take courage and say hallelujah. Because that suffering is bringing obedience in us. So if we have obedience, what happens? Verse 9, and having been perfected, right? Suffering leads to obedience. Obedience leads to perfection. And he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. And called by God as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Okay. So here he's crying and who's supplicating for us. In the end, he chose to lay down his life for us, right? And because of this, suffering, 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 suffering comes to the epitome, the climax. And from there, boom, God says, you are my son. You are now a priest, according to Melchizedek, forever. This is where Hebrews chapter 5 is where God declares that Jesus Christ is our high priest forever because of what he did this. That doesn't mean only Jesus is a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. He's God himself. He doesn't need to do this, right? 
whole reason he came down, he lived this he aged 33 years life like this, and he went up like this, all to do what? He's, I am the way, right? To Father. So Jesus Christ is showing us a way to follow him so we can go to Father right now. So is Jesus the only one who's following the order of Melchizedek? I'm going to write this as M-K. Please don't think that this has nothing to do with you. That's Jesus. That's me, right? The cross says we are one already. We are bound by the power of the cross. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19 through 20. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19 through 20. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast one, okay? You know, anchor is a, a, that thing that holds down a ship, and it doesn't matter how an awful storm there may be in the ocean, this anchor will keep the boat down safely at the harbor, right? And here, the God, God is saying that we have this hope, and the hope is like this anchor. I hope we, I hope we all have the hope, okay? I don't think we knew that we have this hope until we read this verse. What is this hope? That is the anchor of our soul. Let's read on. A hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil, right? Where do you go if you go inside the veil? The most holy place, right? Okay. And verse 20, where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for whom? For us, having become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. What is a forerunner? It means somebody who runs before you. That means you'll be running too, okay? <laughs> right? And he became a forerunner for whom? For us. So what does this mean? Okay. Jesus says, okay, don't, okay, hold on, hold my hand tight, right? Right? Like, the, like a chain candy. He said, you follow me. I'm going in here. You're following me like this. And who is holding in the front? Melchizedek. The order is taxis. In Greek, it means line or rank. Okay? So it's, it's following the line of Melchizedek. For whom? For us. So look at this. Veil, torn. Where do we go now? The most holy place. But brothers and sisters, this is not the most holy place in this visible temple. The temple that Jesus entered is the real temple. The heavenly temple. And that is where Jesus is taking us. That's what Reverend Evan Park always said during a sermon time. He says, ah, oh, if you guys are not deceived by the devil and Satan and always get angry and in the burst into fit, then you'll be worshiping in real heaven right now. Why? Because of he already done this. He's already opened the way. He went in there who, for whom? For us. So let's read one other one. So it's open, so we must enter. That's in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 through 20. Let us not look back, please. Let us only go forward through the cross. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 through 20. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus. At this point, we are not sure if it's, it's the outside holy place, but inside the most holy place, right? But he makes it clear in verse 20. By a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh. So if you're going through the veil, where are we going into? The most holy place. So this way, from here and on, Jesus has inaugurated, means he has established a new way, right? This is the new living way. The one who is declared as true firstborn of God will follow the order of Melchizedek and follow the new and living way and enter now into the most holy place, the real holy place. Amen? Okay. So it's really true. This is the physical world, the visible world, the humanity side of Jesus Christ. 
right? We must know Jesus Christ by his divinity as well. So that we can become one means, means we also enter into his body, right? So this is a, a divinity part of Jesus Christ. Are you ready to go in? Those who have been redeemed by the cross, by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, have made royal priest, as 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 declares. Kingship and priest always come together. But most men only look for kingship. They forget about the priesthood. Amazingly, I say this many times before, the forefather of the, the Korean peninsula, the Korea, the, his name is Tangun Wang Gom. Tangun means priest. Wang, Wang Gom means king. Even our physical long, long time ago ancestor was a king priest. So is our Jesus Christ. And God tells us we are also kings and priests, right? That's who we are. So let's go to. So true firstborns follow the order of Melchizedek. And true firstborns, now as a priest, we have our duty to do. What do you think is our duty? What kind of ministry do we have? Melchizedek, his name is. King of, yeah, Salem, peace. So our ministry is, I mean, our name is Shalom. <laughs> I mean, how, how clear can it be, right? Our ministry is ministry of peace. So can we take a look at what kind of ministry of peace Jesus did for us first? Okay, let's go to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14 through 18. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14 through 18. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barriers of the dividing wall. So what do peacemakers do? Two divided groups always made into one. That is a definition of peace in our Father. Okay. And wherever the peacemaker goes, the dividing walls are tumbled down. There was a big wall between us and God. And Jesus tore it apart for us. So I pray that wherever we go, even though that person may seem very hideous in our sight, can we be the one to tear down that wall between that person and God. That is our ministry. And let's read on verse 15. By abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is a law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that he himself, he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. Making two into one is the way to make peace. 16, and might reconcile them both in how many body? One body. It's always together for Jesus. Verse 17, and he, be, and he came and preached peace to you who are far away and peace to those who are near. 18, for through him we both have our access in. How many spirit? One spirit to Father. This is a ministry of peace that Jesus performed for us and entrusted to us. Jesus, after his resurrection, appeared to the disciples, right? And he gave this command, ministry of peace, to his disciples. And as a matter of fact, we have that engraved in huge stone, and it's right out there in the parking lot. That's why our church name is Pyongang, means peace, peace first church. And that message is written throughout the whole church. Let's turn to John chapter 20, verse 19 through 23. John chapter 20, verse 19 through 23. Verse 19. So when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, it's today, right? And when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. 
So a lot of people think that, oh, because they were scared, God gave them peace so they can be, you know, well secured and feeling better. And so you see verse 20, and when he has said this, the disciples, you could imagine, right? Jesus showed them both his hands and sides, and disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. They're like, yay, Jesus, you're back, right? But then the disciples did not get the point when Jesus said, peace be with you. So he says it again. In verse 21, so Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. And this time he explains the reason. Why is Pyongyangji Church blessed with this command, peace be with you? Next verse. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. Let's check him. God sent Jesus to this earth. And the same way, Jesus is going to send us to our brothers to the end of the world. And verse 22, Jesus says, And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Why do we need to receive the Holy Spirit? Why do you want to receive the Holy Spirit? Again, the purpose, Jesus himself makes it clear. Let's read verse 23 together. Why must we receive the Holy Spirit? Ready? If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. He gave us, as the Pyongyang ministers or peace ministers, the power to forgive sins. Shall we exercise them? our husband or wife or children or cousins or whoever, friends, there may be a big, huge wall of sin blocking them, right? If you forgive them, God says, I will forgive them. Let's do this. That is going into the order of Melchizedek. That is really following Jesus Christ step by step. Okay. Now, I want to conclude with this. This process you know, first is a human flesh, right? And then you become the spiritual. Does this kind of remind you? Um, we learned many times when God created Adam, right? Adam was living being. Right? Living being means you're alive. You're alive fine, right? but you cannot give your life to others just for you. So when we met Jesus Christ here, we walked with him for 33 years of our life, we also became living being, right? Because we met him, we became alive. We were dead, but we were alive. But through the cross, it changes. When we go through Shechem, when we become the firstborn, when we become the priest, when we go in to the cross together with Jesus Christ, to the true priesthood, First Adam is life, a living being. The last Adam is life giving spirit. Okay, let's go to the chapter of transfiguration. First uh, Corinthians chapter 15, verse 49 to 49, 45 to 49. I'm, I wanted to actually speak about this because of this part. Transfiguration how it is attained. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45 through 49. The Bible says it already. So also it is written, the first man Adam became a living soul, living being, right? The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. And now the Bible specifies which is in which order first. What comes first? Verse 46. However, spiritual is not first, but the natural and then the spiritual, right? Does it make sense? This part here, sorry, I'm going back and forth. This is the natural part, right? And then after the cross of the resurrection, it becomes the spiritual. So God is saying, this will come first, and we are there, right? And then verse 47, he says, the first man is from the earth, earthy, Adam is, and we are. But the second man, Jesus, is from heaven. 48. As is, as is the earthy, so also are those who are earthy. That means just like Adam, we are also like earthy men, right? And then, and as is the heavenly, just as Jesus, 
so are also those who are heavenly. And verse 49, let's read this together. It's very important. Just as we have borne the image of the earthy, we will also bear the image of the heavenly. So just as we bore the image of earthy, we will, amen, bear the image of heavenly. And Jesus already opened that way through the cross. He torn the veil. So we are now all like priests and freely able to go into the most holy place. That's the image of the heavenly. You know, Reverend Park said many, many times that just because Jesus Christ came doesn't mean the sun rose from the west and the mountains all over the crumble, crumble down and there's all this like natural phenomena and there's miracles, right? Everything was very silent and quiet. This big transformation that takes place in us, outwardly, it might look the same. I look same old, you look same old, we all look the same. But inside, we are now different. And the next verse right next is the transfiguration. Verse 50, right? Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. We saw that, right? Nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Amen. And I want you to note this next verse, 53. For this, in, this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. And I was very stuck with this expression. Why does God use put on, like a put on a dress? It means this mortal is not going to change. But we are going to put on immortality like a clothes. This perishable is not going to change, but we're going to put on the imperishable. What do priests must wear when they go into the temple? If I want to do a surgery, I cannot go in like this. I have to wear scrubs and go into the operation room, right? What do priests have to do? They have to put on the priestly garment. This lion of Melchizedek. We have been invited to become the royal priest of God. We must put on the priestly garment, and that is ketonet. This word ketonet appeared first when God clothed Adam with the garment of skin by shedding the blood to cover his shame. This ketonet was given to Joseph because his father loved him more than all the other brothers. Very colored tunic, right? That's also ketonet. And this ketonet appears again for the priests. And in Revelation, at the very, very end, when the new Jerusalem comes down, she's dressed in fine, bright linen. This is ketonet. The high priestly garment holds a key to our transfiguration. The high priestly garment holds the message for us to become true, Firstborn, God's priest. So next time we meet, we will talk about high priestly garment. Amen? Okay, let's pray. Our Father God, through this worship service, first of all, we give all the glory and thanksgiving to you for covering all of our shame with you. You have taught us that anyone who is baptized in Christ Jesus has put on Jesus. We thank you for always covering our shame and so we can boldly enter into the most holy place. Just as you have now called us into this heavenly image, we pray that all the shallow members will become so humble, so gentle, so serving like Joseph or our Lord Jesus Christ was. Let us do our Father's will by obeying. When, he, when you tell us to go, please help us to say amen and go. And when we face our brothers, help us not to be afraid. Help us not to be scared. But please give us the heart of forgiveness that Jesus Christ demonstrated on the cross. The mind, the spirit be in us so that we can also forgive all the sins of our brothers 
so that we can all together become one with you. Father, we thank you. Um, the servant is uh, uh, lacking many ways to deliver this beautiful message. But Father, we pray that you will fill us with the Holy Spirit so we'll delve into the Bible, we'll delve into the history of redemption as we study the word. May the life and the spirit in the word transform us into your true priest. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.